Today I want to share with you 10 thrifty kitchen tips to incorporate every week into your traditional foods kitchen. And I've got a helpful checklist that you can easily download, no email required, to help you keep track of your progress. Hi sweet friends! I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now the first thing I want to mention as we delve into this discussion about thrifty kitchen tips for the traditional foods kitchen is that some of you have asked me to specifically define what I mean when I say a traditional foods kitchen. I often talk about transitioning from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen. So what exactly do I mean by that? What I'm talking about is starting to wean ourselves off of buying processed foods. This can be any kind of packaged food, any kind of pre-prepared food, anything that's already made for us as opposed to those things that we can make homemade ourselves. And not just homemade, but homemade better and healthier and more traditional, traditional in the sense of made in the way our ancestors made food, by whether it's culturing or fermenting or sourdough and so on and so forth. And when I use the term traditional foods kitchen, that is really a very broad term because we are all in a different place on our journey moving from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen. For some people, the traditional foods kitchen may be just simply roasting a chicken. And that is often the place where I tell people to start. Just roast a chicken, any chicken, maybe with some carrots and potatoes, serve it with love, sit down at the table, be thankful for the food in front of you, and that meal is going to be so good for you, so much better than anything that you can buy at the grocery store or from a fast food restaurant. And then over time, as we're progressing on our journey to a full-blown traditional foods kitchen, then we're starting to make ferments and cultured dairy and make sourdough bread and make a whole host of things homemade, like our own salad dressings, our own seasonings, our own mayonnaise, our own cottage cheese, so on and so forth. But it's little by little that we progress on this journey. So when I say traditional foods kitchen, it means a little something different to all of us, depending where we are at that point in terms of what we're doing with our cooking. We may just be roasting a chicken, or we may be going all out making pretty much everything homemade. And I want you to know that I'm here to help you every step of the way on your traditional foods journey. And I have videos on how to make so many traditional foods. And I'll be sure to link to my website in the description below. Same name as my YouTube channel, Mary's Nest. And over there I've got videos and printable recipes and everything that you need to get started on your traditional foods journey or progress along your traditional foods journey. Okay, now let's get to the 10 thrifty kitchen tips that I want to talk with you about today. Now what I've done is just make a little checklist here. And as I said, you can easily print this out. You don't have to put your email in or anything. I'll have the link in the description below underneath this video that'll take you over to my website and print out as many copies as you need. But what I've done with this checklist is I've set it up so that there are just four weeks on here along with all the tips listed over here. And what I recommend is that you try to incorporate at least five of these tips each week. And then just go ahead and check off the ones that you incorporate for week one and then week two, you know, so on and so forth as you move through the month. And you know, you often hear scientists say that after 28 days uh, of doing something, it becomes habit and we get into the routine of doing it regularly. And that's really what I'm trying to do to help you uh, by giving you this checklist, you know, tack it up on your refrigerator and it'll give you a reminder to say, okay, let me see what I can incorporate uh, with tonight's dinner or what can I incorporate with today's lunch or breakfast or whatever the case may be. 
And this way, hopefully at the end of the month, this will become a little routine for you. And then you can just continue to uh, print these out and put them up on your refrigerator as a regular reminder and you can start keeping uh, You can actually even save them after you've uh, Made your checks on them and you can put them in your kitchen journal if you're keeping a kitchen journal I have a video where I share my kitchen journal with you and how to put one together I'll be sure to link to that in the i cards and in the description below But I think this can be a very handy tool because some of you actually many of you have shared with me that you can find it very overwhelming to uh, move from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen. And I never want this to be overwhelming for you. And I tell you, take everything very slowly. You don't need to do everything on day one. It's often gonna take you a year or two years to sort of get this running smoothly in your kitchen. And always remember the most important thing is that uh, Having a traditional foods kitchen really has to do with patience and perseverance <laughs> because a lot of things like making a sourdough starter, making ferments, culturing dairy, as I've shared with you, can be a little persnickety. And it's really a lot of trial and error and patience and persistence to get to the point where you really know the conditions in your, in your kitchen, you know the conditions of the ingredients that you're bringing into your kitchen. And this gives you time to start to learn what works best in your kitchen, temperature-wise, conditions-wise, yeast and good bacteria-wise. All of these things are things that you learn over time. And as you learn these things over time, you will become more successful at making ferments and making sourdough bread and so on and so forth. Because I know many of you have told me, oh, you tried to make sourdough bread and with your brand new sourdough starter and it didn't go as you had hoped. And it's often not going to because your more mature or your older starter is going to bake better bread than your younger starter. But little by little, you're gonna get better and better. You're gonna know, oh, okay, my starter needs to, it, maybe it needs three feedings before I bake bread. And maybe I need to let my bread rise a little longer or whatever the case may be. Maybe I need to let my ferment sit in a slightly different temperature area. Or maybe I need to let it sit for a few more days than I did last time on my counter. All of these are the things that you're going to learn over time through patience and perseverance and practice. But what I've got here with these thrifty kitchen tips is something that goes beyond just creating these traditional foods. Because many of you have also shared with me that you're very concerned that moving to a traditional foods kitchen is going to be expensive. And it really isn't. I have other videos where I've shared with you on how to do this all on a budget. And I'll be sure to link to that playlist in the iCards and in the description below. But this is what's going to help you. This checklist is going to help you walk through your, da your daily meal planning and to try and do this as economically as possible. So let me quickly go through these tips for you. The first tip, and I, I know you've all heard me say this many times before, but I want to stress that I don't want you to waste. Don't waste anything in your kitchen. I want you to learn how to cook with scraps, all those little bits and bobs that may have gotten thrown out. And I want you to know I'm not leaving you high and dry and just telling you to cook with scraps. I have a whole playlist with recipes where I show you how to cook with scraps. So this is something that if you can start to practice this, you're going to find that you can make really wonderful meals just cooking with scraps. And nobody's going to know that you use scraps. Number two is I really want you to get into the habit of not relying on specific recipes. Now, I'm not saying that you can't look at a recipe and say, oh, gee, I think I'm going to make that for dinner or breakfast, lunch, whatever the case may be. But I don't want you to strictly rely on the recipe. And the reason is, is if that recipe requires ingredients that you don't normally buy, that is going to increase your grocery budget. 
And then what's going to happen is you may find yourself with ingredients, extra ingredients that you don't need anymore because the recipe may have called for a teaspoon of this or a tablespoon of that or a half a cup of this. And then you are left with things that you may not regularly use. Maybe you never made the recipe before and then maybe after you make it, you don't really like it. Maybe you didn't like certain herbs or spices or ingredients that were in it. And then you're left over with all of those portions of things that you didn't use for the recipe. So what I want you to start doing is learn how to make substitutions. And I have to laugh because many of you have told me when I do a recipe uh, in my videos and I talk about substitutions, they say, oh, goodness gracious, Mary, why do you even bother calling it a recipe? Because you say, oh, you can substitute this, you can substitute that. But that's the whole point. I want you to learn how to be very flexible when you look at a recipe. And rather than rushing out to buy something, look at what you already have and then say, okay, this recipe may call for X spice, but I have Y spice and I use Y spice a lot. And so I'm going to substitute that. And you just learn to make substitutions and experiment. A recipe may call uh, for meat, but you have chicken and uh, the recipe may call for cream, but you have whole milk and so on and so forth. And you just start to learn to experiment with the ingredients you have using some imagination and some flexibility when you read a recipe. And that is going to save you a lot of money in the long run. Number three, you need to keep a well-stocked pantry. And when I use the terminology pantry, I'm talking about what I generally refer to as the four corners pantry, which means your everyday working pantry, your refrigerator, your freezer, as well as your extended pantry or your prepper pantry, where you keep your backup supplies that are non-perishable, but that you use those then to restock your working pantry. When you keep a well-stocked pantry, this allows you uh, to stock up on things when they're on sale or you're able to buy something in bulk or you get a particularly good bargain uh, on a particular item that you use regularly. And it's these type of things that you keep in your pantry that you buy when they're most reasonable that are going to allow you to make budget-friendly meals. And also having a well-stocked pantry, especially with uh, foods that are easy to make into a meal quickly. And I have a lot of budget-friendly recipes for you, and I have a lot of uh, fast and easy recipes for you, and I'll definitely link to all of those playlists. But if you know you have a well-stocked pantry and you have an arsenal, so to speak, of budget-friendly and easy-to-prepare, quick-to-prepare recipes that you know that in some cases can even be ready in 10 minutes. I have a soup that you can make in 10 minutes. When you know you have these things at the ready, it's very easy then to avoid stopping potentially at a fast food restaurant to just pick up something because you're thinking, oh, I can't even think about making dinner. I'm tired. I don't really have anything on hand. I don't have a recipe that uh, shows me how to throw something together quickly and so on and so forth. So having that well-stocked pantry along with an arsenal of recipes that uh, <laughs> The type I share with you that, re that allow for a lot of substitutions and a lot of flexibility, but that can be thrown together quickly are really going to help you save money and also feed yourself, your family, your friends, whomever you're feeding, a much healthier diet. Number four, I highly recommend periodically trying to practice a no spend challenge. Now, there are a lot of folks on the internet who do this. There are food bloggers, there are YouTube creators. There is a lot of resources for this. And this is a great way to really have a thrifty kitchen. What you want to do is look at your well-stocked pantry. <laughs> Go back to number three. What you want to do is look at your well-stocked pantry and see what you have in your Four Corners pantry your working pantry, your fridge, your freezer, and your extended pantry, and how many meals 
can you successfully make over a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, whatever you want to do. Some people will just do it for a couple of days. Some people, you know, as I said, a week or longer. And get into the habit of practicing this periodically. Maybe as your seasons are changing and you want to start kind of clearing out uh, some of the seasonal foods in your pantry before you stock up on what's coming into season. That can be a very good time to do this. But if you start to make this a habit where you take a week, it's, it's very good to just start with a week. And even if you can't do a week, just a few days, but it's very good to get into the habit of doing this, as I said, on a seasonal basis. So maybe four times a year, you say, okay, for one week, I'm gonna have a no spend challenge. I'm not gonna buy any food and I'm just gonna cook out of my pantry. And you will see what a savings that's going to be. And now for number five, what I want to share with you is that you need to start learning how to grow vegetables and herbs from scraps. And don't worry, I have a video where I show you how to do that. And I'll be sure to link to it in the iCards and in the description below. There are many vegetables as well as herbs that are easy to grow from scraps, which you'll learn about in that video. But one that you can even start with today, if you've got some scallions or sometimes known as green onions in your fridge and you're gonna use those in a recipe, as you chop them down, the little root on the bottom, just leave a little bit of white with the root on the bottom and stick that in a glass of water and you're gonna be amazed to see how quickly they're gonna start growing back into green onions. And I show you how to do this with a whole host of things like cabbage and celery and herbs. Herbs are very easy to grow from scraps. If you just have a little piece of, of basil left over or you have a little piece of thyme left over from a recipe that you made and maybe you're not growing these in your own garden, your own kitchen garden. Instead, you're maybe buying these at the grocery store. If you save a little, I show you how to root it and get it going. And before you know it, you're gonna be growing all of your own herbs what, from what were originally just scraps. Now, number six is very important. You want to learn how to make homemade versions out of expensive store-bought items. And I have a playlist where I show you how to make so many things from cottage cheese to yogurt to your own crackers, mayonnaise, a homemade cereal, ho flaked cereal, homemade granola, granola bars, all these things can easily be made homemade. And I show you how to do easy versions, like when it comes to crackers, just slice and bake. But when you learn to make all of these things homemade, not only are you going to save money, but they're going to be more wholesome and more nutritious. They're gonna be more traditional foods. For example, I show you how to make a whole host of homemade salad dressings and homemade seasonings. And the nice thing about it is they have very limited ingredients and they have wholesome real food ingredients. Did you ever pick up a bottle, for example, of salad dressing at the grocery store? And often the ingredient list is so long on that little bottle. And it's maybe like an Italian dressing. Whatever happened to just olive oil, vinegar, and a little seasoning? But there's all of these ingredients. And many times what's very disappointing is with these salad dressings that are sold at the grocery store and mayonnaise and various condiments like that, they're often based in soybean oil. And soybean oil is a very highly processed oil. And it's an oil that we wanna move away from as we progress on our journey to a more fully traditional foods kitchen. Plus, I show you how to make your own homemade condiments, but they're just not any condiments. I show you how to ferment them, like fermented ketchup and fermented homemade mustard. So not only now are you making these things homemade, you're fermenting them, which means you're injecting, in essence, or creating, in essence, good bacteria in these condiments. And then you can fry up my kid-friendly uh, beef liver nuggets, as I call them, and have your kids dip them, or even as my husband often says, husbands do, uh, dip them in the fermented ketchup. And what a wonderful meal you have that's not only nutritious, but it's delicious and very rich in good pro probiotics. 
And why is this all so important? Because scientists tell us that probiotics are so good for our gut health. And the healthier our guts are, the healthier we are. So as you're on this journey to a traditional foods kitchen and you want it to be a thrifty journey, learn to make as many things homemade as you can. Whether it's cottage cheese, mayonnaise, salad dressings, sa seasonings, croutons, <laughs> what else do I have? I have so many things for you, breadcrumbs, and a lot of these things are made from scraps, which is nice too. But just start. Say, okay, I'm going to try one thing. I'm going to make my own homemade breadcrumbs from a little leftover stale bread that I have. Wherever, whatever you do, just start. Just try making one thing homemade that you may otherwise have bought uh, pre-prepared or packaged for you. When you start making these kinds of things homemade, you're going to see a significant savings in your grocery budget and you're definitely gonna have a thrifty kitchen. Okay, now for number seven, this is very important in terms of not only having a traditional foods kitchen, but having one that's a thrifty kitchen. And that's learning how to preserve your own food. Now, whether you grow your own food or you're buying it at the farmer's market, and if you've seen my previous video on thrifty tips that I'll be sure to link to, I talk about how to find sources for buying fruits and vegetables as well as other foods in bulk at reduced prices. But whatever way you are getting your food, you want to learn to how to preserve it to extend its shelf life for as long as possible. Now, don't worry if you're not a home canner. I have plenty of videos on uh, that are directed specifically for the beginner on uh, water bath canning, which is a great place to start if you're new to home canning. And you, I'll, again, I'll link to all of this. You know, if I run out of space in the iCards, I'll put it in the description below. But uh, I walk you through step by step what books you need, what equipment you need, and then I show you how to home can a whole bunch of different things uh, using the water bath canning method. And as I said, it's definitely directed at beginners, and I walk you through step by step by step. But preserving food is not just about home canning. There's a lot of ways to preserve food. And I do have playlists on all of this, and I'll be sure to link to it. You can definitely dehydrate food, and you don't often need any special equipment. So if you don't have a dehydrator, don't worry. There are a lot of things that you can dry in a cool oven, and I show you how to do that. So learning how to grow your own food or buying it in bulk, whatever the case may be, is not only going to provide you with a nice source of food for your pantry, it's also going to save you money. Because for example, once you learn how to can tomatoes, even tomatoes that you've purchased, and you learn how to home can those and you can water bath canned tomatoes, it's going to be less expensive than if you have to buy canned tomatoes. And the same with herbs. When you learn how to dry herbs and make your own home seasoning blends, it's so much less expensive and so much more natural than if you're buying dried herbs. So try starting to learn how to preserve your own food. And I think you're going to find that it's really going to be a wonderful thrifty kitchen tip for you. Alrighty, number eight is something that I really like, and it's what I call a clean out the fridge meal. If once a week you can just look into your refrigerator and see things that may be leftovers or getting a little <laughs> past their prime, whatever the case may be, pull all of that out of your refrigerator and just use your imagination, be a little creative and throw something together. There are so many things that you can do. The other night I had a little bit of uh, fish left over and it was kind of the tail end and it wouldn't really heat all that well. It wouldn't heat up all that well without getting dried out. So I chopped it up, mixed it up with a little mayonnaise, a little sour cream, some green onions, and we had this wonderful fish salad that we put on some nice uh, crackers and it was just delightful. Another night, I think I had one chicken thigh <laughs> that was in my fridge that really needed to be used up. And I had some other veggies and whatnot. And all I did was pull all the meat off of that that I could, 
chopped it up and mixed it with some veggies and a little salsa and I just used it to make chicken tortillas. So just look in your fridge and remove those things, put them on your counter that, you know, as I said, are you know, getting to the point where you need to use them up and just be a little creative. A lot of times you can do a stir fry or you can do things that you can put in a taco or you can wrap in a tortilla. You know, I'm in Texas, so I tend to think of tacos and tortillas. Uh, there are things, you can make a soup. Uh, you can make, like I said, a salad. There are a lot of different things that you can do with just using a little bit of imagination. But what will be so rewarding to you is that when you actually are cleaning out your fridge, you're not filling your garbage can with food that maybe a week or two earlier could have been turned into a meal uh, that no one would know were things that were just little leftovers here and there all around your refrigerator, but you took them and turned them into something that was delicious and nutritious and, you, and the nice thing is, I guess one of the most important things is that it didn't wind up in your garbage. Now, number nine is something that I really love. Now, I can't 100% take credit for this. This is something that, well, I guess I'm sure a lot of people have done this, but I get a kick out of uh, the chef and cookbook author, Jamie Oliver, who calls this concept the mothership meal. And what number nine is, to make a nice big meal once a week. And this is the kind of thing that I sometimes like to do on the weekend, whether it's a Saturday or a Sunday, and maybe we just have a nice sit down Sunday dinner and I may roast two chickens or make a really large piece of fish or make something that's meat-based, whatever the case may be, but I make a lot. Like if I, as I said, if I roast chickens, I may roast two chickens. So I've got this mothership meal in essence that can help me throughout the week. And what's so nice, if you know that you've cooked a big meal earlier in the week, if you have worked long hours and you're tired and you're thinking, oh, it's just so easy to stop and get takeout or pick out or pick up something from a fast food restaurant. If you know you've made this big, in essence, mothership meal, you then know, oh, okay, I've got some really lovely cold chicken in the fridge or I've got, you know, depending what time of year it is, maybe you made a nice beef stew. That can be warmed up on the stovetop in five minutes. So knowing that you have these foods already cooked and in your refrigerator and ready for you, maybe with the roast chicken, you've got some leftover carrots and potatoes that can be warmed up easily. Maybe you've got some rice that can be turned into a fried rice and served alongside whatever other main mothership meal food that you cooked. So having this large amount of food cooked early in the week gives you some uh, reassurance that you have something that can be warmed up easily without a lot of work so that you can save money by not doing takeout or not doing fast food. So developing this habit of making this mothership meal can really uh, create a thrifty kitchen because not only are you reassured that you've got some food in there, as the week goes on and you get to the point where maybe you're going back to number eight and you do your clean out the fridge at the end of the week, a clean out the fridge meal, whatever little bits and bobs you have left over, you can turn into one of those clean out the fridge meals. Or maybe it's really come down to the point where you just have some scraps and you go back to number one and you cook something with scraps. So really having that main uh, mothership meal in place can really help you check off a lot of things on your checklist as you go through the week. Now, number 10, is something that I've talked about in the past, specifically when it comes to making bone broth, and I've basically called it, you know, like a scrap bag. But what I'm calling number 10 is start creating something in your refrigerator that you can call your soup container. So as you go through the week and you're making meals, maybe you have some scraps that really can't be turned into something. 
into a meal. Maybe you've got some onion skins, which are very nutritious. Maybe you've got some garlic skins that are very nutritious. Maybe you have the very bottom root of your celery. Whatever the case may be, maybe you've got some carrot peelings. Start putting these things into your soup container. This can serve two purposes. One, you can actually use it to make soup that you cook maybe in a bone broth or a broth or a stock, whatever you've got, or even just water, and then you puree it because yes, onion skins are edible, so are garlic skins, you know. All of these things can be turned into a soup and then pureed. However, if you don't want to do that, this soup container can then be transferred into a bag, or some sort of freezer-proof bag that you then go ahead and put in your freezer and you save that for when you're ready to make bone broth. And this is how you're going to start being able to make bone broth for basically pennies a batch. Because as you make your roast chickens, whether you do them as a mothership meal or over the course of many weeks, and you start to save those chicken carcass in your freezer, when you get three carcass, because that's generally what I recommend, I find that makes the best chicken bone broth, but when you get those three carcass, you're gonna put that either into your stock pot or your slow cooker, your instant pot. I have recipes to show you on how to do it in all of these different appliances. You're going to put those three carcass into whatever appliance you use, and then you're gonna retrieve your soup bin here your soup container and whether you've just got it in sitting in your refrigerator that it's been collecting these little uh, different potential soup scraps throughout the week or you're going to retrieve that bag from your freezer and now it's all filled with all of these different bits and bobs so to speak that you're going to dump into uh, whatever vessel you're using to make your bone broth along with the three carcass of your chicken that you've saved and that's going to be able to allow you to make bone broth literally for pennies. You don't need to add any more carrots or onions or celery. These bits and bobs are loaded with nutrients and they're going to add vitamins and minerals to your bone broth and you've not thrown them out. Now your soup container can also serve, just as the name implies, as a soup container. As you save these scraps and you want to puree it, great. But say you have other scraps, say you have a recipe that calls an, I, I never go for this, I don't like this when people say half an onion, because what are you supposed to do with the other half of the onion, you know? But, what you can do is, and if you make sure your soup container has a good cover on top, especially if you're using these aromatics. But if you have a recipe that calls for half an onion, you can put that half an onion in your soup bin. And say you have like a little leftover chicken or something that nobody ate, like I had that one thigh. You can put that into your soup bin. And if you're getting the other scraps, like maybe you don't want to make a puree so you, or a cream soup, so your, your onion skins, your garlic skins, your carrot shavings, the little nib of the uh, celery and whatever other uh, vegetable scraps you may have uh, that really would not be very presentable in a more traditional brothy soup, you can go ahead and put those directly into your freezer-proof bag that you've labeled for your bone broth scraps. And now your soup container can hold that half an onion or that, you know, half a carrot or half a celery stick or half a zucchini or whatever, you know, the different recipe that you may be using called for. Although I'll tell you, I never follow, you know, as we've talked about, I'm very flexible with recipes. And if it says half an onion, I'm using the whole onion. But if you do want to follow something um, a little more exact, don't worry, just put that into your soup container. And then at the end of the week, look in your soup container. Do you have like maybe, you know, a piece of cooked chicken, a piece of cooked fish, a pea, you know, a couple of uh, vegetables that you didn't use the whole thing? Or maybe you were just cutting something up and nobody finished, you know, uh, the vegetables. And so you put that in your soup container. And then you can make a wonderful vegetable soup or a chicken noodle soup or whatever the case may be, whatever you have in that soup container. 
So be sure to head on over to my website, marysnest.com. I'll have the link in the description below. Go ahead and print this up, get this on your refrigerator, and start keeping track of how you can incorporate these every week into your thrifty <laughs> traditional foods kitchen. Now, if you'd like more information on how to stock your pantry and your prepper pantry and how to do this all on a budget, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a very detailed playlist with all sorts of videos about how to, how to be thrifty and be prepared and have a traditional foods kitchen. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.